And then I realize I have poop splatter on my t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, I'm, like, I'm like, this is going to be embarrassing. <laughs> Because it's not like anybody's <laughs> not going to know that's poop. You know? So I had to make a choice. I could either sit there, <laughs> hope for help, or just get up and face the embarrassment so I can open my pack and get high. Uh, and then... Nobody got you pooping in your hand, mm -mm, bro? Mm -mm. Uh, I never even told anybody. You were the first person I told. Really? Mm -hmm. I never told a soul. <laughs> and then I told the world. <laughs> Best so. story ever. Eric Fravel, 45 years old, <laughs> longtime drug addict, just survived cancer. <laughs> oh, you're a trip, bro. You're a trip. Uh, okay. Can we do it again? Yeah, yeah. So thanks for coming. Eric Fravel, 45, <laughs> longtime drug addict, cancer survivor. Oh, man. I don't know how this is going to go, y'all. This is going to be awesome. This is going to go really wild, y'all. So bear with me. So we have Eric with us today, man. <clears throat> um, I don't really want to worry about the last one we did. Okay. Let's just talk about you right now. How'd you come up, uh, you know? In a car. In a car? In a car. It's a Honda. I drove here. It's a Honda. That is not and mine. It has a radio. Yeah, it's an old. It's the old lady's car. She gets a radio. <laughs> She's special. Right. But you had a, you had a decent family growing up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had. Uh, well, I'm adopted, but uh, the family that adopted me was a decent family. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, before that, I was, you know, my birth mother was a prostitute, and I was, you know, along the ride, along for the ride on that one, which, as you can imagine, was. I'm sure unpleasant. I remember none of it because, you know, the brain's a wonderful thing. It, it tends to to forget all of the horrible things when you're a child or a lot of. And, uh, yeah, but uh, and then as I got older, I had uh, my best good friend when I was a kid died. And uh, before that, I had started dabbling, smoking a little bit of weed here and there with him. He was like, don't ever do anything but weed. And then he died. And I decided that I was going to be a drug dealer with a heart. I wouldn't do anything. I, w I, wasn't, I wouldn't sell anything I wasn't willing to do myself, mm -hmm. which apparently is a disastrous idea for a business model. I just want to make that very clear now. And uh, so I, I, I used drugs for many, many years, many years. And you started uh, young getting in trouble, right? Oh, without a doubt, dude. I robbed my first store when I was 17. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, there's like a like a, the window there from 17 to 19. I committed a lot of felonies and got caught. Like I get caught for everything, bro. I'm I'm the worst. I'm I'm a horrible criminal. Yeah, a terrible drug addict. You know, I mean, really probably a terrible person. But in this case, uh, robbed a store, got out on my 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 folks bailed me out that time because you know they didn't think that I would do such a thing, and uh. Then while I was out, I, I think I went to go rob another store, this time at gunpoint. And because I'm, I might be the smartest person on the planet, I just want to make that clear now. Smooth criminal. I'm telling you, bro. Best that's ever done it. So I decided I'm going to rob this Funko Land, okay? And uh, I, I, I go in at night. It's like 9 o'clock. It's right, right before closing. This is my plan. Okay, and I'm dressed from head to toe as like a cholo. You know what I mean? Like I look like a Mexican gangster with sunglasses. And I think this is disguise. Okay. <laughs> so because the sunglasses yeah, at night aren't well, obvious. And dude, I mean like top button buttons, you know what I mean? Like the whole nine. So I'm thinking that the cops will be looking for somebody of a Hispanic, you know, nationality. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, so apparently walking in just before closing, looking all like that, is enough reason to call the cops. I don't know how I didn't see that coming. So I go into the store, and I've got a, uh, I've got my my piece. You know what I mean? Because I'm a gangster. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I've got a gun. Mm -hmm. I'll explain the gun in a minute. Mm -hmm. And when I go in, there is like a uh, mentally challenged little girl in the store. And uh, she's like playing the video games because back then you could play the video games in the store, try them out. 
and uh, I didn't pull out my weapon. Okay, my weapon didn't come out, and everybody's like, "Oh, at least he's got a heart." No, here's the deal: it was a BB gun. Okay, I had a sawed-off shotgun in the car, but it was too cumbersome. I decided, so I'm carrying this BB gun. That back then, you know, they didn't have the orange tips and stuff. And I'm planning on robbing the store with a BB gun. So here's the thing, okay? This girl's mentally challenged. If she decides to run off, I'm not going to shoot her. So what choice do I have? I sit there and wait. Because that's what smart criminals do. They give everybody enough time to call the cops. You know what I mean? That's what happened. So <laughs> as the little girl's leaving the store, before I can even pull out my weapon, cops come rushing in, dude. Gun to my temple. And I mean, like, dude, this cop is shaking, begging me to move so that he can shoot me. And I was immediately like, okay, y'all just need to get this dude away from me because he's going to kill me. And that's not what I'm here for. I get busted for that one. Needless to say, my parents got hip to the fact that I might be up to some, you know, criminal stuff at this point because I've now been arrested for the second time. And this one's an attempted robbery. They decide not to bail me out as they should have. And I have a buddy, you know, that's from an affluent area in town and he bails me out. He bails me out. I go home. My parents kick me out of the house. And this is like, just before I turned 18, I think. And so I leave there and I'm staying at another friend's house that's in an affluent area. And as it turns out, his parents don't even know I'm staying there. But this chick at the time was like, well, she had this like childhood boyfriend or whatever, but she was cheating on him with me. So she was like, well, come on over to his house. And he was, he was an acquaintance. She said, I've got the garage code. They won't mind. So at 17, 18 years old, I have a whole house and no responsibility. It's like risky business. Yeah, I, uh, I threw a party. Like, like risky business. Yeah, it lasted days. And uh, uh, like <laughs> there's holes in the wall everywhere. Like it was, uh, it was a disaster. And uh, apparently some stuff got stolen. I actually did not steal these things. They were power tools. So the kid that I had been staying with briefly, that his parents didn't know, had stolen this stuff and gone to the pawn shop with it. His name's on the pawn shop ticket. I still got charged for it. So I got a plethora of charges for that one. B&E, grand larceny, multiple counts of each. Nobody you know, else got charged? Nope. And they all not told on you? Yep. It happens every time. People always telling. People telling. Yeah. And so... Uh, <laughs> so that's your first set of felonies of what, oh, how old are you, 18? Well, see, I kind of got them all back to back because mm -hmm. the, the Funko Land stuff hits as I'm... Uh, like, they they wait till I'm 18 to charge me. So they charge me with all that stuff. And I get convicted of that. And I'm doing three months. The day I'm leaving, this is my very first bid. This is when I got my gangster card. Okay. My very first bid. So... I'm walking out the door as I'm walking out the door. And the cops have been to see me multiple times for their investigation, mm -hmm. but I haven't caught any charges. As I'm going out the door, I'm packed out. They hit me with my charges for the, for the, the, the residents. And so at this point in time, I'm in bid mode already. You know, I've, I've learned how to bid. So, Damn, but you're right there, like ready to come out the door. You're yeah. getting ready to be released from prison, mm -hmm. jail, whatever it is, even yep. if it is only three months. And now it's like, hold up, mm -hmm. record scratch. Exactly. And they go so, back. Yeah. So I went back to, to where they sent me and, or where I was, just laid down and went to sleep because I figured I'm not getting out for a long time. Okay. And sure enough, uh, my parents came and bailed me out again. I think it was my parents. Pretty sure it was my parents that time. Yeah, they came and bailed me out again because they thought that I'd, I'd paint my, my dues. You mm -hmm. know, I'd done three months. and So they're giving you another you know. chance. Yeah, exactly. And uh, while I'm out that time, I still couldn't stay with them, but they bailed me out. No, you know what? Chronologically, I've got this messed up. Every time you tell the story, you got it messed up. You know, yeah, man, it's so long Doesn't ago, Doesn't really dude. matter, but they got you out. Parents forgive you or they don't forgive you? Uh, at that point... Uh, they help you come out, but they're not letting you move back in. I got to backtrack a little bit because there was even more charges. Okay. While I was still out, 
Okay, I had gotten the bond, the second bond on the home invasion stuff, or mm-hmm. not home invasion, but you know the robbery or mm-hmm. whatever. I gotten that bond while I'm out on bond then, because I'm mad, I'm insulted that I got these charges that I did not deserve. I'm so smart that I'm beating the system because I think if I do it again, it's double jeopardy. I really thought this at the time. So you go back and rob the place they charged you to rob it? Yes, I did. The Funko land or the property? No, the property. I went back in the property and I stole their guns. And you took the guns. I took the guns. And so uh, I buried my sawed-off shotgun out in the woods and quickly sold off the, the pistols. And inevitably, they came and got me for those two. And I think that's the one that that they kept me inside on. Either way, whatever. I couldn't go, I couldn't leave when I was supposed to. After the three months was done, um, I had managed to, to like get a low sentence because I'm just turning 18. And uh, I think I had to do like weekends for like an entire year. It was some crazy some setup crazy like that. Sentence. So it was nuts. Through all this, what are you using? How are you getting high? You're robbing things. Yeah. You're well, going to jail. Then, like, what's making you do that? You're just having fun or are you getting high? No, I really thought I was that smart. I really did. It was just absolute arrogance. I thought that if I could have anything I wanted, as long as I was willing to do what it took to get it. So I was willing to do what other people weren't willing to do. And because I had successfully robbed one store and got four, four, 4,000 off of it, I really thought that this was a career path. So, you know. What's the money for, though? Well, the money was to have money because I didn't have money. So, and I'm working. You know what I mean? Like, I was working, but, you know, when you're a kid that age, you don't make much. So, at the time, I'm I'm selling pot, you know, started selling Coke, you know, started doing Coke. You know, that, that's when things started to snowball, you know, but. At that point in time, it was still a party because yeah, yeah, you know, you're still having fun. Exactly. There's that phase, you know, you haven't, I didn't hit the addiction button yet. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't to the point where I couldn't say no. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? At that point, I could still say no. I just didn't want to, you know? So I ended up uh, shortly after getting out, I moved out to the valley to move in with my folks. And uh, I did well for like the first six months I was out. And then. Now, what I, age are you now? I'm probably 19. Okay. And uh, I did well when I first got out, but I was wrapped around the axle like this chick that I had been with since the first charge. Like I was wrapped around the axle over. She was bad news. But I was still, you know, I'm in love as most young people do. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, of course, liked getting high too. So I would, after, after six months, I've got a car. I'm starting to get my stuff together. So what do I do? I start going to raves again and, and and festivals and you know like i've got like this whole triangle that i make in the state that you know to pick up and drop off drugs and then after that like after that i started working out in harrisonburg and this guy introduced me to delauded and for those that have never done delauded i can only say it is if you shoot it it is really like oh i have found god because in my mind, that's where I was at with it. I still didn't understand. I had no understanding of addiction, though. So, like, I'm shooting Delauded every day for eight months. Then my dealer moves. And this is my very first detox. Oh, I thought I was going to die. Yeah, the withdrawals are the worst. Oh, it was horrible. It was so bad. And I thought maybe if I drink a little bit, maybe that'll help. No. no not at all. Make you feel worse. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um. Uh, yeah, anytime I was, uh, I would try to use a little bit of alcohol too. I was telling you the story about riding that little 12 inch bicycle to go get those 12 six packs. That's awesome. <laughs> we had to reshoot that video. I want uh, to see you on the bicycle. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why we'll reshoot the video. Um, but uh, <sighs> it never made me feel better. It might like make you forget about it for a minute, but man, when the, when you hung over, it just made your oh, withdrawals 10 times 10 worse, times worse yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it was terrible. So, you know, this triangle that I've set up, I, I, I actually, <laughs> I rented a shack that I swear was no bigger than this. I swear there was a bed, bathroom, like everything. It was like one room, okay? What are you trying to say, bro? This is probably a fire awesome. established. Yeah, in comparison, huh. definitely. Okay. Absolutely. 
Okay, so and you're so, living in the shack. Yeah, and I'm I'm working, I'm selling dope, you know, and when I say dope, I mean like coke, weed, you know, Dilaudid. I was selling a lot of Dilaudid on like the uh, uh, James, no, yeah, James Madison campus, JMU. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, still doing the festivals and everything, and I did that for a long time, long, long time. I was, I had my first experience trying to get clean when I was 24. When I was 24 years old, uh, we're back living with my folks. And I, th I want to say that the girlfriend, who is my daughter's mother, told my parents, blew up my spot totally. And she did that, I think now for self-preservation so that she could keep her place to stay, go do what she wanted to do. And I wasn't in the way because they kicked me out. So they kicked me out. I went and stayed with this dude in Winchester and uh, I'm on the train tracks just walking around town because at this point I found crack and mm -hmm. I've shot coke and like things have escalated very seriously. And I saw like I'm, 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 I'm standing on the train tracks. There's a train coming and like I'm depressed, I'm devastated. I don't have my kid, I don't have my family and I'm nothing. And I'm like, yeah, I think I might just let this train hit me. And I stepped off the tracks and looked over, decided against it. I stepped off the tracks, looked over, and there's the local rehab. So I walked in and said, you know, what do I got to do? I need some help. And uh, they had me go stay at the Salvation Army for a couple of weeks while I was doing their day program. I did that for two weeks. I'm doing their day program. And then they let me come in as a resident did 30 days in there and uh where was that edge hill that was edge hill edge hill i love those folks dude great place um so so then uh after i i ended up getting kicked out like like almost my last day so you told me one time about laying in there very sick too though right oh you know, yeah yeah so I've, how did that work you go in there and you're you're coming off of drugs you're yeah you're well drawing, i mean I've, right? yeah I've, I've detoxed there i mean i've been there four times okay yeah and uh uh, well, this, in this instance, this was the first time, the first time I, I ended up getting kicked out for, cause I'm young, I'm stupid. I'm messing with a girl in there. Mm -hmm. They catch me. I've got her up on the washer, like out in broad view for everybody. Mm -hmm. And one staff walks up the stairs and just goes, and I was like, damn. Kicks her out too? Yeah. Kicked her out too. Well, they kept her at first and then kicked her out later on. And, uh, after somebody else had her against the wall. Uh, well, it was probably actually me at an apartment in town when hmm. they were walking to their meeting. She may have stopped at this apartment oh. in town, yeah. Wow. But uh, so uh, at this point in time, uh, well, you know, I'll tell you what. Honestly, life's a blur. I'm just going to get into my rehabilitation story, okay? So uh, first time. Life's a blur. Yeah, it really is, dude. Like yeah, between all addiction the, and cancer, and, my brain and, is and toast. all those things that happen right there just seem to meld all together. Yeah. You yeah. can't remember which time was which. So, so fast forward to right now. Okay, let's let's talk about the last five years. Last five years, Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, because um, the last five years we've been pretty connected. We yeah, was working well, I mean, together. We was we was hooking up on a regular basis. Yeah, uh, I'd say I'd say in the last six years hmm. uh, is when I've been doing quite a bit of time. In lockup, right. I just finished a, and a, it's because of the perpetual cycle of using, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, you've seen. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're gonna say three bids ago. Uh, I'm on probation, and let's see. What was the first violation? The first violation. Drugs. Well, no, no, they're all drugs. Right. Every one of them right. is they're drugs. Definitely drugs. Yeah. the The first one though, when they when they put me in, I think I was out on the street with Brandy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. that's anyhow. This I get locked is, this up. This is for when this you one. were homeless, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, and lived in a tent, which mm -hmm. you know was wild. But uh, so so uh, I go in for that one. I get out, and this is when I'm working with you and James. This is when I, the very first time I started working with you and James. Mm -hmm. I think I could be wrong, but anyhow, I'm out for four and a half months, and then I start fucking up again, and. I get caught. So this is what you started out in that halfway house. Yep. And then as soon as you leave the halfway house, you went to move in with some chick. Yes. Right. And then yeah. you start the craziness. Oh, no, no, no. That's 
That was the second time or whatever time. Yeah, that was the second time. Right, because there was a lot of times that happened there. It's the same thing over and yeah, over again. over and over. You were in the halfway house, you're doing fine. Killing it. Not mm-hmm. using, passing your own screens. Yep. As soon as you're given freedom. Boom. Off to the races. But it's not, and you know, I, I don't want to say that, ooh, I get out and immediately I want to go get high. Uh, for me, you know, I would, I would drink and then I'd get high. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I would, I, I don't really have a problem drinking. Mm-hmm. The problem is that it lowered my inhibitions enough to where then I want to go get Coke. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so I end up uh, going back for the second violation. And this is around the time that, that you were just talking about because I get out, I'm in the halfway house. Same halfway house, so then go, you go back to each time. Yeah, and then this time I end up staying out for nine. No, this was the last time I stayed out for nine months. Four and a half, the one before that. And then, okay, so it was like this. Violation. I'm out for like a week. Okay. Go back in. I do the halfway house. I'm out for four and a half months. Go back in. Come back out halfway house. I'm good for nine months. And that's when I got hit on this one. And and each time the time's getting longer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Starts yeah. out well, with six months. The first time it's six. Uh-huh. Second time it's seven. Uh-huh. Third time it's two years. I just finished that one. Right. Which, and, uh, which was your first visit to prison. Yes. My very first prison visit. Uh, How many years have you done in prison total if you added them up? If I added everything up, I'd probably be around six years. So All over there. drugs. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, your initial charges started out being mm-hmm. doing something to get drugs. And maybe I, to support a lifestyle, which drugs were a part of. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, but what have also, you been charged with? Break and entering, grand larceny, uh, concealed weapon, uh, manufacturing, distribution, credit card fraud, credit card theft, obtaining under false pretenses, uh, burglary tools, and then probation violations. It's a lot of charges. Yeah, I think I. I think but it, but but the breaking and enterings and things like that were when you were younger. Yeah, and, and see, then as you progressed into the drug lifestyle, that's when your distros and stuff started coming, correct? Yeah, and it's one of the things that I seem to have done in my life is when I get hit for something and I do time, I don't repeat it. Like after the B and E rash, never again. Never broke mm-hmm. in another house. Mm-hmm. Never broken anywhere. Wouldn't do mm-hmm. it. Then I get hit with distros and all that stuff. You're thinking of another hustle, but your hustle's always illegal. Exactly. And and then uh um, you know, obviously I can't sell drugs. I did it for sixteen years and did it successfully, I guess. Well, if you get hit with a dish right now, you're Yeah. If I get hit again, I'm smoked. Bless you. Almost. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. So uh yeah, this time, you know, I was good for nine months, and uh, I have found that something that motivates my relapse is emotional grief. Grief is usually what pushes me. And eventually, I guess for me, <coughs> for me, this would be the first time that I've ever not, the reason for not doing what I've always done is simply because I don't want to. It's really just that simple. It's not because, oh, I've got all this or I've got all that. Sure, it helps to motivate. You know what I mean? Like uh, right now I can say with 100% certainty that everybody that is in my life is there for my benefit. As in like, I don't have the hangers on and the leeches. And, right, right. You know, I don't have people trying to suck off. And me, even some of the know? old people that you did know don't know where to find you. Yeah, exactly. And I and that's not. So what would you do if they did try to reach out? What if somebody reached out right now? It's like, brr, brr, oh, I've had people. I got reach, some crack. Yeah, I've had people reach out to me, and I just don't. So respond. what would you say is your drug of choice? Like, what what drug did you like to use the most? Yours. Okay. Everything, buddy. Didn't matter what it was. Nope, if it I'm... was going to get you high, you liked it. Mm-hmm. But you like Coke a lot. I love Coke. Loved a lot coke. of money on coke a lot of loved money heroin. on crack loved heroin right loved allotted and i i still love them i just can't do them mm-hmm. it doesn't work for me you know like i'm 45 i'm tired of getting locked up and it's dude. the same like just now it makes me think of like we spent what two weeks or so running the street smoking oh yeah 
Yeah. Uh, that was a chaotic time, bro. Yes, sir. I didn't take a lot of sleep. I took yep. my son's car like he didn't need it, and we just drove around. You remember that? That was the first violation when I was in that house. That and, was before we started working and I started yep. straightening up. That was before I went in, too. Yep. Yep. So that was before I went in and did the, the three months inside. Yeah. So. Yeah, we've run into each other inside. Yeah. At least three times, two or three times. Two, I think two. All right. Um, One but, time we was both in AB together. The second time we ended up being bunkies. Yep. Which yep. we're getting ready to be here on this trip. In it's going to be awesome. In this trailer. Well, it's bigger than a cell. So it we'll is. be doing something. And it smells better. It does. It's warmer. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't smell like a toilet. Yeah. I'm really happy about that. Yeah. So, so uh, hopefully we can make all those videos work out. I'm sure we will. Because it's going to be There's a no fun doubt trip. No Because I want you to go on this ride with me, man. I was telling you earlier, I asked a lot of people to go on this ride. And nobody wanted to go. Oh, I love well, This motherfucker's about to take off. Bro, you know, I'm, I'm down for And it's going to be a fun ride. We're going to be able to go here, go there, talk to people, maybe change some lives, man. No. Straight up. And at the same time, if it keeps us straight. We're helping yeah. everybody, everybody involved. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I kind of learned along the way because, you know, me going to Edge Hill four times, it's not like I, I didn't lose the information that right. was attained. Me staying in recovery, I've been clean for two and a half years twice mm -hmm. and a year one other time. So that's six years of my life that I had opportunity to grow and learn. Yeah, you know and, what I mean? Right. And you're pulling out a pair of pliers when you should have pulled out a ratchet. Mm-hmm. You know, and you think you're dealing a little bit, but really you're just fucking the bolt up. Yep. Straight up. So now. So last time you're in too, you're in for the last violation, do mm -hmm. two years, end up in prison. You're using in prison. Yeah. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. So how's that go? Take me through, take me through going in and, and, and continuing to have a habit. What's your thought process? There? Okay. Uh, well, this last time when I went in, I didn't, I I didn't really have a bad habit yet. I had really just started dabbling. And of course, I got caught because I always get caught. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, because you know, way you was on a bench for more than three or four weeks. Not even that. No, it was way. two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Because I, when you break, gave me your paperwork, I mm -hmm. knew you was going to jail. Yeah. Well, I mean, I told you mm -hmm. I'm going to jail. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I go in and, uh, man, it's lit. It was lit when I got there. You know, there was Spice or K2, whatever you want to call it, going around everywhere. And I never really had a lot of experience with it. But because I had a little bit of money, I bought up everything I could get. I learned that I like eating it far better than smoking it because I don't get near as paranoid. So Spice K2, what is that? That's a synthetic, what's supposed to be a synthetic marijuana that's basically sprayed on paper and, uh, you know, you either smoke it or eat it. But it's a chemical instead of a... Yeah, very chemical. Uh, so, yeah, and then, of course, there was, you know, some box and strips inside. And uh, I, I did as much as I could of those. And, mm -hmm. you know, it uh, uh, it's a hustle, just like anything else is. And that's, you know, for people like us that are, you know, we're always thinking about making money, you know, so... Right. That's the people that... so. Some people might think, like, how are you getting drugs in prison? How are you getting drugs in jail? I I will not reveal those secrets hmm. because there could be somebody doing it right now, hmm. and I don't want them to get caught up. I, I, I definitely, uh, you know, just because I'm not there doesn't mean I don't get it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because for real, I'm not going to lie to you. If they pick me up right now and said, look, you got to do five years, I'm going to be fucked up for five years. You know what I mean? Because what else do you got to do? You know what I mean? Like right, but that's a, that's a mindset too. You can go in there and get your life right. You can go in there and learn. You can go I mean, in there. Maybe and work I'll get out to that. Maybe I'll exercise. get to that point. Maybe I will. Right, but that's the thing is we don't want you to go back. Exactly. If I go back, I'm defeated. I'm done. You know what I mean? Like that's how I look at things now. It's like there's no. I don't do anything that should put me back inside, and I don't do anything that could put me back inside for a reason. I don't want to be there. So, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was in Winchester. I'd been there, I'd been there months, maybe half a year, maybe more. I don't know. It's kind of a blur too. And, uh, you know, we've got this whole setup where, you know, strips are moving and, you know, everything's happening. And, uh, I was supposed to get work release or supposed to go to outside trustee and then work release. And I'm on the list and I'm the next on the list. And then one day they come in and pack me and three other people up. And they're like, you got to go back to the main jail. 
And I'm at this point, I'm at the CC building. And the basic idea was that I was administratively removed from that building. They knew that shit was floating around. They knew I had something to do with it. And they fixed the problem. <clears throat> so then I go back over to the main jail and, uh, you know, there's a little bit floating around over there. And of course I get tied in with the people that, that are, that are plugged in and, and it thank I'm thankful that that happened because at that point I had a habit. And so when I got over to the main, I was able to kind of wean off a little bit. I still got a little bit sick from it though. And, uh, then it's my time. It's like, Five months after I've been sentenced, that's how long it took for them to take me to prison. And I guess it's because of all the COVID shit, whatever, you know. So five months it takes, and they come tell me it's time to go, and I'm excited. You know what I mean? I've heard all these great stories about prison, how much fun it is, you know, because, you know. Great stories about prison not and how fun it is. Like it's like Candyland. In, in you know comparison what I mean? or just in, in comparison general. to the county lockup. Okay, now yeah. that makes a little more sense. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah general, I'm excited yeah. because my. You know, and the way I'm looking at it is my time is going to fly by. I'll blink and it's I'll be faster. out. It's faster. It's yeah. faster. There's more to do. Yeah. And so uh, I go to uh, Nottaway for receiving. Mm -hmm. And there's 10 of us crammed in one of these dog catcher vans, which mm -hmm. is literally a metal box smaller than this, you know, that, that you have enough room to just kind of sit there like that, you know. And uh, there's 10 of us. There's 10 of us. They came and tested us for COVID. How's it smell in there, bro? It's terrible. It's, it's not, not good. good. There's, no, there's nothing good. Whew. It's a four-hour car ride. Four hours cramped like that. If you got to piss, Ugh. you're shit out of luck. Ugh. Anything, you're shit out of luck. So we get there. We had been tested for COVID the night before. They come out. The Nottaway people come out and test us. And one dude pops hot. Everybody's got to go back. We all got to go back. Everybody's got oh, another man. four Get hours. Get back in the taxi. Let's oh, go. Dude. So four let, hours back to yeah. the jail. They let us use this Johnny Blue real quick before we left. We didn't even have nothing to eat, dude. Like, yeah. they moved us before breakfast. And by the time we got back, God, it must have been four o'clock at night. They didn't give you nothing in Ottawa? Like, send you a packed lunch? No. Some bags, uh -uh. yeah. that's just dirty. Yeah, I, I thought so too. Well, you know, one 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 facility thinks it's the other facility's problem, and the other facility's like, no, nah, that's your problem, right? And they don't want you to have to poop in that box. That's a fact. Oh, that'd been that'd okay. Been so horrific. you get all the way back, you get don't give away back. all your stuff and everything. Yeah, I've obviously. already given everything right. away. So they put I got you back nothing. in the same block. No. Oh shit! Totally that's different. Really it's sucks. like yeah, it's like in a quarantine. Damn, pod. Now I can't even get hookups from my boys that I just left. Yep. Okay. In a whole different spot and. They're like, we don't know how long, how long it'll be. It's, it's up to DOC to have you come back. So then I order again and order all my stuff, which, is, which isn't which is cheap by jail standards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and sure enough, a week later, we get our stuff, and the next day they come get us. Of course. That's mm -hmm. the way it always works, ain't it? So I gave that crap away again because out here people were happy everywhere you went you were spreading a little joy Here's yeah a little no love, doubt some coffee some mm -hmm. brand new shit yeah, yeah it's crazy and they saw you coming without a doubt so uh so yeah um we make the the four hour trip again mm -hmm. i get to nod away and nod away is like uh it's like candy land if you're a drug addict you're happy you know what i mean because mm -hmm. there's it's got everything there mostly female ceos and they're tricking. There's no doubt in my mind. I know for a fact, I know one dude banged one out in a closet. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, bro, and I'm seeing these broads bringing the, the pack straight to my, my dude's cell. You know, like, if you pay attention, you see how the whole place runs. And it's exactly what people told me prison would be. You know what I mean? Except I was, I was still in receiving. I hadn't gotten, you know, I wasn't, you know, with the population yet. But, uh, hell, within... Three days I was high, and we were on lockdown. We were quarantined when we first got there. We were supposed to be locked down, not, not do anything for a week. So let me ask you this. Do you really think I'm going to let you get away with not telling the story? I'm getting there, bro. Of how you got I'm getting there. What, how, no, 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 no. It's after you not away. Right over. Oh, no, it's not. It's from not away to the prison. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to let you go. All right. Go I'll get there, I promise. Go ahead. All right, so I'm in Nottaway. It's Candyland. Everybody's having a great time. And there's drugs everywhere, huh? 
everywhere. So dude. there's what Suboxone, meth, meth, uh, uh, right? Yeah, coke was in another building. You know, how about and, spice or weed? Yeah, there was spice, but they wanted outrageous prices for it. it was crazy, right? Um, so so you know, I'm I'm catching a buzz the whole time I'm there, pretty much, and Suboxone. Yeah, with Suboxone and uh. It's getting to be about that time. The forty-five day mark is usually when people get moved, and ours is coming up. And there's like this big debate in the pod about whether or not you got to piss when you hit, when you touch down at your next spot. Old heads are like, "Nah." Other guys are like, "Yeah, you definitely do, definitely." Okay, so my time comes. <sighs> <laughs> it's that time. It's that, it's that time. time. So my yeah. time comes, mm -hmm. and I have decided that I'm going to pack for the trip. Keep in mind, okay, you know that this is my second at time. At least, at least second time. No, this is my second time. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, one of those probation violations way back when, mm -hmm. I took something for the ride. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that story later. Well, we're gonna. I'm going to have to go back into yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to go back into this yeah. a different time. So this time right here is the second time that this you are... This is the second time packed for the trip. Packed. By packed for the trip, I mean I have a pack, which is Suboxone. It's in the finger of a glove, it's wrapped up, and it's in my butt. Okay. <laughs> so... My prison wallet. <laughs> how, how, how did you put it in there, though? Uh, with gotta, my finger. You gotta tell me. I, about, okay, listen. You gotta tell me about going in the cell and the little and the the little. Yeah. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. All one. right, look. So the first time, way back when, with the probation <laughs> violation, you remember I tried to pack for the trip. I walked back into your room and I'm like, oh, it just fell out. I gotta put it back in, right? So this time, I'm thinking I'm gonna make this easy on myself. Put a little hair grease on this thing. That'll take care of it, right? So there it goes, straight up in there, right? Not a problem in the world, right? Well, I am I think I'm smarter than everybody, still, obviously, because I did it the night before, thinking if they try and run down on me, you know what I mean? Before this time, I want to make sure I'm ready because this, these got like three strips. They're coming with me. So the next day we go on this ride, which was six hours. Six hours in a van. You're going to love this part. <laughs> in a van. Cuffed up. Oh, it's terrible how DOC transports. But there's a bucket in the back of the van for us to pee in. What? Yes. This is real. That's terrible. Yeah. I peed in that bucket. I did. I was uh -huh. the second person to pee in that Driving bucket. Driving down the road and everything. Yeah. How oh, does yeah. it Trying smell, to stay bound. bro? There's just like pee over there in the yeah. corner? Ooh, that's gross. It. That's yeah. disgusting. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely horrific. Man, we get there, and uh, it's a level one, okay, because I'm a super gangster. I know. Mean, uh, so they take me to this level one, which is like a big farm and uh, with a lot of razor wire. And this lady comes out, and she comes up on the bus, and she says, if you show your dick to any of my COs, it's mine. And, like, I'm the only one in the bus going, I don't think she means what she just said, because that doesn't sound right. So I go in. I'm not the only one that's packed for this journey. Okay, there's this other kid, stupid kid. He's, like, 19, and I know the feeling. I've been 19 and stupid. So... He brings, see, I think he brought a little bit of Fetty with him. And uh, I've got these subs. I get in there and. Uh, fentanyl. Fetty's fentanyl. Fetty's fentanyl, yeah. And, and so immediately this kid's doing transactions. Like, you don't even know the lay of the land, dude. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way I would ever do that. And people are even warning him, like, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. They're hip to him immediately, right? Well. I decide this pack's got to come out. Okay, because Finally, I, after... Yeah, oh my God. Oh my God, it must have been at least 18 hours. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So, so, yeah, I go to get this pack out, and I've got the jumper on, you know, because I'm in transport. So, the bathroom is situated, like, literally, you can poke your head up like this and look the CEO straight in his face across the room. Okay? And there's, like... <laughs> So I go, you know, jump around the ankles, T-shirt on underneath, and I'm thinking it's going to work like the first time where, you know, like, I'll just pluck this pack off the end of a turd, 
and I'll be good to go, right? <laughs> so I put my hand back there, like, and and I proceed to feel warm wetness pooling into my hand, <sighs> and I'm like, oh my god, fuck, you know? And I look, and sure enough, it's poop, <laughs> soupy, poopy. <laughs> So, so, <laughs> even worse, the pack's not there. So I got to reach back and dump the poop back in the toilet <laughs> and put my hand back and wait and push, right? So I feel the squirt again of the Hershey, okay? And, and then I feel like a little, little pink. Like, up oh, there's the pack. <laughs> I'm so excited the pack came out because I was worried that, like, it popped or something and I lost my shit, you know? So then I'm like, okay, what do I do? Because the sink is, like, there's a barrier between me and the sink. I'm, like, in this little closet of a toilet trying to hide, and I have shit <laughs> all no over my hand. You got no water. No water. <laughs> you just pooped. I just pooped in my hand, and I have no water, right? So, <laughs> so I dump, I, I pluck the, the pack out. I dump the poop in the turlet, okay? And my first concern is the pack. <laughs> okay because you know i'm committed to this you know I, I already know that this is ending poorly like this is going all wrong for me are you gonna vomit <laughs> no okay all right so i grab the toilet paper a lot of it try to wipe out my hand a little bit <coughs> try to wipe off the pack a little bit and it's not going so well so my only option is the water I'm sitting on. So I flush it, take my hand and the pack, dunk them, flush it again, flush it again. And then I pick the pack back up, start trying to wipe off with, with as much toilet paper as I can, you know, stick the pack in my sock. And then I realize I have poop splatter. On my t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, I'm, like, I'm like, this is going to be embarrassing. Because it's not like anybody's not going to know that's poop. You know? So I had to make a choice. I could either sit there, <laughs> hope for help, or just get up and face the embarrassment so I can open my pack and get high. So, of course, I choose oh to get up with the poop on my shirt. <coughs> and they haven't even given me clothes to change into yet, uh, mind you. So I got to walk around uh, with poop on my shirt. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's like a good splatter. Like, if you took paint and we're like, eh, uh, it like poop. Just like that. I don't know when it happened because there was liquid and, you know, it was a messy situation. It was, hor it was horrible. It was horrible. I, I can say with... with a pretty high level of certainty. I don't think I'll ever do that again. <laughs> so after this, okay, I've gotten high. Nobody knows I've got this. Nobody has any idea because I'm not telling anybody. Uh, and then nobody got you pooping in your hand, mm -mm, bro. Mm -mm. Uh, I never even told anybody. You were the first person I told. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never told a soul. And then I told the world. <laughs> So, story ever. so so i get up and i mean within a couple hours you know i've gotten my clothes man they're shaking us down within a few hours because this kid running around with his fetty and okay trying to make all these moves a on a new bean, like yeah you know something. exactly and so like they make this announcement and they're like okay look if you came from another facility we're gonna piss test everybody Everybody on the on, on the whole on, on in the whole spot. Everybody's getting a piss test. If you're gonna piss hot and tell us, if you tell us, then you won't get more time. So I'm like, oh fuck. I am confronted with a choice here again. Shit. So there's people, there's there's a guy from Winchester I know, young kid, good kid, 
he's still he was still green though and i was like bro how does this place work you know because i don't have anybody else to ask he's got a couple of his buddies around like and he goes you should tell him you should tell him because if you piss hot and you don't tell him then they're definitely gonna move you and you'll be like level two or three and i was like okay so i tell him and they said what are you gonna piss for i said that is unknown it could be mm. anything mm. And uh, damn, you don't want to go in there and be like, yo, I'm hot for this, this, and yeah. this, and then something else. Mm -hmm. So, so at this point, you know, they piss me. And the major, the second in command, comes up to me and he goes, are, are you okay? I was like, yeah, why? He goes, you just pissed hot for a lot of things. Are you sure you're okay? I said, I'm just fine. You don't need medical. No, I don't need medical attention. I've been doing taking care of that myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Did I you not see all the meds? In yeah, my exactly, system? exactly. So I go on back, and uh, sure enough, next words I hear are, "There are dogs outside." Oh, I'm thinking, okay, I'm taking a hit, but I still got my pack, which means I got I got money coming. I got you know you know what the pack means. So then I hear the dogs are here, okay, and I don't know if they can smell Suboxone or not. But they smell like oranges to me. Bro, they definitely have a scent. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, fuck. So I eat like one and a half. Yeah. and uh, Which is a lot more than you're normally taking. Oh, my God, yeah. Dish, right? Oh, my God, yeah. And I, I flush the rest. And uh, I thought I did. And they bring these dogs running through and whatnot. And it wasn't until after the dogs left, I found a little sliver in my pocket like that. It was in my chest pocket. I guess it broke off and I didn't even know it. So I could have got smoked right mm. there, dude. But uh yeah, so uh I then slept for like the next two days. Yeah. And they, you know, my 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 being hot <laughs> kept me a nod. From, yeah, absolutely. Pretty much in a absolutely. nod. And I was I was sick after that for like a good week. All right. So you're sitting in prison to this point. You're still using like this has been a No, cycle. not anymore. This was the end of it. This so is the end of my still using. there? You moved to another spot. No, this is this is the level one. I'm mm -hmm. in the prison. I've pissed hot for him. I've pooped in my own hand. You mm -hmm. know, it's going great. Yeah, right. Good times. So then, uh, you know, they give me this job making like 47 cents an hour. Like, I don't even ask for a job. I don't want a job. You know what I mean? Because the fact is, you're going to pay me 47 cents an hour, but you're getting paid like the normal wage 20, you know what yeah, i mean like absolutely. it truly is modern day slavery dude it is bro it really is and it should not be legal mm -hmm. um so and they, they'll only give me certain jobs because i pissed hot you know what i mean i can't get the good ones i can only get the trash ones so they come up to me after a week and they're like hey you're working here they don't ask me they just tell me i'm like Okay. Yeah, I think they pretty much just give you jobs there because they're trying to put you in some type of. Well, usually they just let people come and ask if they want to work, and eventually they get, they they make you take a job. But usually people are like, "Oh, I want to do this, I want to do that." Not with me. They're like, "This is what you're going to do." I'm like, "Okay." So I go do that. Okay, Eric, this is what you're going to do. Okay, I go do that. And uh, um, man, I had this lump in my neck. You know, it was pretty noticeable. And it was on my lymph node. Or it was it was my lymph node. And I was like, and I'd, I'd gotten checked out in Ottaway. And the doctor said, wherever you go next, follow up about this. He said, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but you need to follow up about it. So when I got there, you know, that's what I, I told them. And and uh, eventually, they, they got a doctor to come see me. And their doctor's so senile, he shouldn't even be practicing anymore, dude. So this guy, he feels it and... You know, same old BS that I'd heard before. Oh, it's a reactive lymph node. No big deal. But I'm going to go ahead and send you to an ear, nose, and throat guy just in case. This dude sticks a scope up my nose and down my throat and says that uh, I need to go get a CAT scan. You know, I guess I had gotten an x-ray already. Went to this ENT guy. He scoped me. He said, you got to get a, a CAT scan. So I had to do two CAT scans, one with dye, one without dye. I get those done. And they're like, you need to do a biopsy. Okay, so they got to stick a needle in my neck, take a little bit of it out. Dude, they took me to the hospital to do that. Normally, they sedate you. But because I'm in cuffs and in a jumpsuit, no sedation. Hmm. I had to turn my head like this and let them jam this fucking needle in my neck like that. You know, I couldn't see them doing it, but I knew it was happening. 
And I'll tell you what, it was one of the weirdest feelings. It was painful, but at the same time, you can literally feel stuff being sucked out of you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was hard. It was harsh, bro. It was harsh. Like, and I left kind of shook because it's, it's not cool. So anyhow, I hate doctors. I get back and I find out, you know, uh, and it took, uh, it actually took my old lady complaining to DOC before that biopsy got scheduled. Two months earlier, I had been referred for the biopsy. Two months is how long it took that facility to schedule me the biopsy. No, the uh, ENT had, uh, had ordered the biopsy. No, excuse me. It took him two months to get me to the ENT, who could expedite the process. So for two months, you know, they're like, yeah, you've got this lump. We're not really sure. And two months I sat there. And the only reason that, that I even found out that I had cancer while I was in prison was because my old lady called DOC. DOC sent me a letter. And I had the letter for a full day before the, uh, the prison came to me to tell me that it was scheduled. I already knew it was scheduled. I had the piece of paper from DOC, which means that they schedule it, not the prison. You know what I mean? Like, so they were dropping the ball, mm -hmm. which shows you how much they give a shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, I find out I got cancer in prison, which is really unpleasant. You know what I mean? But I don't have too much time left on my sentence. So I'm like, okay, so they've got it all, you know, worked out to where I go see a doctor when I get out and so on and so forth. But... I actually got out and all but the biopsy, I had to do all over again. It was like starting from scratch because it's in different areas, I guess. And uh, yeah, so uh, I had to do. So you found out that you have tumors in your neck and then you yeah. finally get a count, right? Yeah, I got a PET scan after I got out. And uh, it's cool, man. Like It really shows you like slices, like horizontal slices going all the way down your body. And because of the, uh, the dye that they, it's like radioactive dye they give you before the PET scan, it'll light up tumors. Dude, they showed me the PET scan. There's like 10 tumors in my neck, hmm. not including the big one. And so they said, well, you've got uh, head and neck cancer and you're going to have to uh, do chemo and radiation. And I'm like... Okay, so surgery's out, and they're like, I've got 10 tumors in a cluster around my lymph nodes. And there's, they're like, there's no way that we're going to get them all out. It's just not going to work. So we're going to go ahead and do it this way. And, uh, man, you know, I'm pretty cavalier about bad situations. Like, that's all right, we'll just do it and get it done. You know, dude, it whooped me. It whooped me. Like, I was, I was, I was hurting. It was probably, it's easily the worst time i've ever had like health wise mentally just it was it was horrible you know what i mean the, the first i'm confronted with my own mortality and thinking about how this will affect my kids and what a piece of shit i've been on my, my entire life and like you know at that point in time i start thinking like there's not even enough people in my life to carry my coffin you know what i mean i, I start thinking like that like you know shit got real that's what happened. Shit got real. It's not fun anymore. You know, this life that I've been leading is not, it's not, it's not yielding a good result. Because at the end of everything, dude, we're left. The only thing that we can leave behind is memory. You know what I mean? Like, sure, I can leave you money and everything else. But the fact is, the most important thing I can leave behind is like what my kid's memory of me is. And to that point, my kids know I'm a drug addict. You know what I mean? They know, you know, that I'm a scumbag. You know, the people in my life, that's what they know of me. Mm -hmm. So I'd have, I'd have been going out. And, yeah. that's, and that's the legacy I would have left. So that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately, too, is legacy. And, mm -hmm. then, and then seeing Steven die the way he did. And then having his kids reach out to me and talk to me about some of the <sighs> things they said. Man, I sitting with his mom yesterday for an hour and a half and hearing some of the stories she was telling me about the last days and, and you know. It's fucked up. I bet. And uh, I did the same thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I almost died right there from a needle. Narcan brought me back to life, all that shit. And that made me think from there, too. Like, how? what would that do? What would that do to my kids? You know what I'm mean, saying? You personally already know. Yeah. Facts. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I have I have a choice to make. 
And I think you have that same choice to make too, man. Sometimes it takes that reality of death in your face. Absolutely. I'm the, I dude, I have to hit my head to learn anything. I've always been that way. Like I do what I want. Well, I'm going to hit my head 10 times, but yeah. you know, there won't be an 11th. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's really how I've always been. And you know, with this, you know, it really it kind of shakes you to your core. You know what I mean? And like, they put me on Percocet and fentanyl through the through the chemo process. Dude, I actually threw stuff away. You know what I mean? I actually, because it was making me sick. Like, I was trying to identify what, like, I was trying to feel better and I would feel worse. You know what I mean? I'd be vomiting and it's just, it was so unpleasant. I can tell you with 100% certainty, I have no desire to ever touch fentanyl percocet i just don't want that stuff anymore because it's just not for me like it doesn't it does not yield the eric that i like does that make sense mm -hmm. so you know I, I i'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination you know uh, and and the one thing that i hope to do going forward is to meet people and leave them with a pleasant experience having talked to me. You know what I mean? Like, and I I hope somewhere along the way that that I affect other people's lives. And you know, that's the thing is that like, we all affect each other's lives, even in the grocery store. You know, my dad used to say, you never know when that person that you said hi to was just thinking of themselves, how lonely they are and how they're about to kill themselves. But just because you smiled and said hi, Oh, he noticed me. Mm -hmm. You never know what little gesture, you know, might actually turn things around for somebody else. And I think, you know, in today's society, it's just, it's important to be a decent human being, you know, and, and does that mean I'm always going to be decent? No, no, I'm, I'm still a human being. I may screw right, up. Right, right. Yeah, I'm but, still, I'm still gonna lash out sometimes yeah. uh, irrationally and act stupid and say dumb shit. That's who I am. That's what mm -hmm. I'm gonna do. I'm trying to be better at that. Yeah. Right, so you're just trying to get better at living. Mm -hmm. And you know, I learned that that that, uh, that uh, all relationships take effort, every single one. It doesn't matter if we're an acquaintance, you're my daughter, you're my mom, my best good friend. Every one of them requires maintenance, which means that I have to talk to these people if I care about mm -hmm. them. I have to be around them. I have to show interest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like. Like it's, it's, you have important. to genuinely make that call and exactly. be like, Yo, what's up, dude? How you doing? How you mm -hmm. feeling? What's up with you? Exactly. And then, then you can go into, well, let me tell you what happened. Yeah. Right. Right. But at least you got to go in there and be like, Yo, what's up? And mm -hmm. I hit a couple of y'all up on a regular basis, just like, you know, and I might call you and cuss you and treat you like shit, but that's because I care about you and I'm trying to stimulate conversation. Right. I mean? <clears throat> so, me. so on the upside, after two months of hell, which, by the way, I have to say this, those little kids that go through what I went through, those are the bravest people I think there are on hmm, the planet. No dude. shit, huh? They are gangsters. They are for real gangsters. You know what I mean? Because they deal with it with a smile on their face. They're, of course, they're still still sick, but they they are better adjusted than a lot of adults I know. You know what I mean? Because they already know what's important in life. They already know. You know, so it's hmm. it's it's the trappings of of life have gone by the wayside for me. Like I don't care how much money I ever have. I won't ever care. What'll matter to me is my people. That's what'll matter to me. And that's what it'll always be from now on. I know that's a fact. You know, and uh so on the upside, I did get news. <laughs> You're gonna love this part. So well, you already know. Mm -hmm. I finished. I finished treatment. <laughs> they have to wait three months before they can give me another PET scan to find out if I've still got cancer. So I got three months of like, oh my god! And they've already told me that. Well, if you still have it, we can't irradiate you again. Be or can't do radiation again because it will irradiate you. It will kill you. Hmm. So I don't know if that means I got. To, I would have had to wait a while or what. But in my head, I'm thinking, dude. I just went through the worst beat down I've ever had. I don't ever want to do that again. And uh, I got the PET scan and they told me I'm in the clear. I'm good to go. Fravel one, cancer zero. Right. That's why we've been waiting so long to do this right here. Mm -hmm. So 
So after they tell you that you're bro, not going to die. Yeah, even after they told me, it took a week. It was like a week before I'd leave the house. Like, I don't know what the deal was. I mean, like, I don't know if it was like a PTSD shell shock type of thing or what. I feel like maybe I was holding my breath for six months. And then all of a sudden they told me, okay, you can breathe now. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm in the house, and I don't even want to go out and smoke a cigarette. I don't want to go on the front, front porch. I'm totally good in my house. Don't want to go anywhere. Don't want to do anything. <clears throat> so I did that for, like, a week, and then I, I I started waking up again, I guess. You know, like, you know, because, you know, I think about things. I'm introspective that way, you know, and I'm, like, thinking to myself, well, I'm probably a little institutionalized. Probably, you know, I'm definitely, <laughs> there was some damage done from from my, my uh, treatment. You know what I mean? Like, like. Yeah, well, if it, it fries your brain, right? Absolutely, dude. I, mean, I get holes in my brain. It's definitely your brain. You're going through chemo and radiation, radiation, right? Yeah, I've actually got a stripe in the back of my head that won't grow. And radiation is basically like the microwave. Cook, yeah, they're cooking you. Right. Absolutely, I had blisters. Killing everything in dude, order I, to kill the cancer. Yeah. There, right? You, you basically have to outlive the treatment. You know what I mean? Because it's poison. Chemo is poison. There's nothing good about it. You know what I mean? It's attempting to kill part of you. Because those cancer cells are a part of you. Right. And the idea is that you outlive the cancer. That's it. So you're truly, like, when they say cancer survivor, that's what it means. Like, you survived so what, the treatment. What are a couple of the symptoms? Tell me about some of the things that you went through during the treatment. Like, oh my with how you felt, how you could eat, how it oh, affected those Oh, it was terrible. Uh, well, first for pregame, I had to go to the dentist. You had to pull, like, four teeth out because... Uh, the radiation would make it so brittle that if during treatment teeth had broke or my my mouth hadn't been right, they wouldn't have been able to do anything about it and it would have been a, like a, a, a quick, fast way to get an infection. All right, so you know the first I mean? thing is let's get rid of anything that can get affected. Yep, Heal so then, then I started doing that. And, you know, every step of the way, it's crazy. I, you know, I love to live in denial, right? They'll tell me, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get sores in your mouth and in your throat. I'm like, ah, they tell me about the time frame that it's going to happen. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen to me. <laughs> Bullshit. It happened a lot. So, like, I went from eating regular food and uh, being able to taste things. I lost all taste, constant dry mouth, blisters up and down my throat and in the back of my mouth. Um, I, <laughs> I lost, well, I don't want to say lost, but it cooked off the hair on my neck. You know, and it was so weird when they finished, like I had like a mustache only because I couldn't grow a full goatee. They it cooked all the way over to here and they kept telling me it'll come back. Mind you, it's been three months since I stopped treatment. And uh, I was like, it's not coming back. And she's like, it, it'll come back. I'm like, OK, it better. You know, so uh, I still have no. She said, I'll probably never have hair on my neck again from the radiation. I'm only assuming that that little stripe on the back of my head, you know, on the side of my head, I guess, is uh, is going to stay that way, too. Uh, it took my taste buds still aren't all the way back. They said Easter is when things will start to get normal again. And sure enough, mm. it was starting to get normal again. Like I just started being able to think clearly, uh, you know, I still have major memory problems. Huge. Me like, dude, chemo. I would go for chemo and sit there for, I think it was four hours, getting pumped with this stuff. And then I would go home. And I'd fall asleep. I couldn't even tell you what happened the week after that. Couldn't even tell you. You know, it was, and it happened all the time. And then, like, remembering, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. It was, I feel bad for people that have, like, Alzheimer's and stuff like that. Because, dude, I'm telling you, when you know what's going on, and you know you can't remember. Hmm. It's horrible. It's horrible, dude. Hmm. Like I was looking at myself, like I'm gonna be brain dead. Like I'm never coming back. From yeah, this. you did. You walked around like an idiot. Yeah, and yeah. that's there the was truth. No, there was no absolute. There was the nobody banter, driving. The banter was very yeah. You know, lame. Wasn't joking. Just kind of. Mm. Uh, and when we started out, we was making fun of everything. Mm -hmm. you know, like you can't kill us. Yeah, we were born February 9th. That's right. We don't die exactly, and we don't obviously. Superhero status. All right, so right now you're walking the line, right? Like, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing for, you know, using? What do you do every day to not get high now? Like, I know it's just literally over. Like, you're literally yeah. just now 
coming into the reality that you're going to live, that you're not in jail. Yeah. You're still on probation. Mm Mm-hmm. Still on probation. But you're thinking about what you're going to leave behind at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, um, ask that again. What do you do today? What do you do today not get high? Oh, oh like on a day to day basis. Like you know, that's and methadone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I, I actually as soon as the Percocet stopped because I'd been on them for God, it was like five months. So as it was getting ready to stop, I got myself to a suboxone doctor. Like and the chemo doctors and stuff, they would have kept giving me the Percocet. You know what I mean? But I didn't want it anymore. So and I know you've talked about trying to come off the subs too yeah, already. Exactly. I've it's already, only been a month or two, but yeah, I've already leveled down. And uh, <laughs> I feel like you've evened out the at first you were way yeah. high, you were way naughty, you were yeah, way exactly. fucked up, and now you're not like that. I don't mm-hmm. know. And uh, you know, I was I was concerned because I know my own history. So I, I went the suboxone route because I knew there was a detox coming. And honest to God truth, I'm I was tired of being sick. You know what I mean? Like, I'd been sick for months, mm-hmm. and I just didn't want to be sick again. I didn't mm-hmm. want anything else to make me sick again. Yeah, Jesus, let me feel yeah, good for a minute. exactly. So, you know, I, I started doing this box, and, and, you know, you remember, I almost stopped that completely. And um, they talked me into, well, just, you know, try and level it down. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, I also, you know, periodically I'll smoke weed. Now, weed actually was probably the most helpful drug through the process. Okay. Because, and I don't like pot. You know I don't. Right, like I know you don't. I'm not a pothead, but I lost 50 pounds in the process. Couldn't eat. You know, I was a week away from having a feeding tube put in my stomach because I couldn't eat anything. You know, and and so when when all that and on top of that, the best way I can describe this, smoking pot is a little bit dissociative, and chemo is very dissociative, and so. I could do chemo and smoke pot and trick myself into thinking I'm just stoned. That's why I'm so, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like it, it, it made me feel a little bit better about how stupid I was. Mm-hmm. Helped you eat. Yeah, it definitely helped me. Eat. That was the biggest driving force behind it was that I had to eat. And, uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I've, I've only put on like 15 pounds maybe, but, it's I was overweight to start with before everything started. So I've got you know, I got another ten pounds to go. But now I'm to the point where like I don't smoke weed all day. You know, I might smoke in the evenings for dinner or something like that, you know. And uh yeah, that's it. That's all I do, buddy. Eating and dealing. Dealing with day to day. Oh yeah. I was just like dealing, I don't do that no more. Yeah. Uh yeah, man. And uh, you know, I got uh, a nice house that needs fixing up. So I spend a lot yeah, of time. Yeah, you spend doing a lot that. of time staying busy doing that. Yeah. Idle hands. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I'm at the point now where, you know, uh I'm hanging with you on on doing this whole thing and, and you know, I still got, you know, a paint gig that that, that I'm trying to work out on the uh, on, at back home and and I'm just I'm trying to be active in my people's lives because here's the one thing that I saw, you know, like I hadn't really been tight with my family for like six or seven years and no joke, every member of my family, my immediate family showed up for me through the whole cancer bit, through the whole thing. They were there every step of the way and you were there too, Mm -hmm. you know? So like I got a handful of people in my life that, I know are always going to be there. Right. Does that make sense? Right. And I'm the type of person, I feel like I've got to give back Mm -hmm. to those people because those are the most important people to me. Does that make sense? Like I think about things like if I'm really grateful to have something, then I do what it takes to maintain it. Doesn't doesn't that make sense? You know, so like. The best thing you could do for every one of us is stay straight, not go to jail. Well, that's just a start. Other than that, that's the, yeah, but I'm saying other than that, like. We talk, we deal with each other, and we do what we do. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But if you're not fucked up, then we're able to do that. Exactly. That's, that's what everybody's going to say. Oh, I know That's it. what your mom, brother, yep. old lady, kids. Every one of them. Everyone's going to say that. Because mm-hmm. when you're straight, that's the Eric that we love. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. So you don't have no, uh, like, social sites or nothing that you really keep up with, do you? If I mean, anybody can Facebook. find you, where can they find you? Facebook. Mm-hmm. Just under your name, same as it is in the title. That's it, buddy. That's it. If you want to holler me, ask me a question, whatever. I'm down to talk. You know, I'll probably, I'll probably ride your coattails and eventually start a channel of some sort. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm content right where I'm at right now. 
like I'm in like this giving back mode. So like, you know, I gotta fix my house. I gotta fix my mom's house. You know, you roll with me on all this mm-hmm. stuff, dude. We do stuff for here. We do stuff with my mom. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's yeah. where I'm at. You know, because like y'all, everybody showed up for me. You know what I mean? The least I can do is show up for them. You know, and I try to push myself, man, beyond like, yeah, I'm still weak. Like I moved the lawn yesterday, dude, and it about killed me. Like I came in, I could feel it in my back. Yeah, that's and, another reason I'm gonna get you out, get yeah. you out of the house. You got yesterday, you have done some. Today, you're gonna have done some. Tomorrow, you can take a break. No, I got four appointments tomorrow. Uh, Busy then day the tomorrow. The next day, you can take a break. But you yeah. can see how it makes you feel. You got to build mm-hmm. muscle back up. Yeah, bro. that's where I'm at too. You get down into that little bit of nothing that was, you know. I, dude, I was living on like on on those insures. Well, and, yeah, you were a skeleton. Crazy, bro. Absolute skeleton. But yeah, I'd like for you to, you know, get involved. I think when we take this trip, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be awesome. You know, this right here is going to go up right as we're going on the trip. I'll tell you what, here's kind of a a perspective too that like I've realized this. In the last six years, I haven't really actively taken part in society. Like I don't even know what's going on. I came out this time and to me, I came out to a whole different world. Like everything's online now. Like, like that's really for real. Like everything mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. online. Like I missed COVID. So think about all the changes made from COVID mm-hmm. to all the technological advances that have taken place in the last six years. Dude, it's a lot. Yeah, I went in for six years and came out to a whole different world too. Yeah. CDs were on your visor of your car. Mm-hmm. And then when I came out, there was 900 songs on a thing that big. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And I'm I'm like every day I'm for real. Like I'm like mm-hmm. look, looking at stuff on my phone. I'm trying to catch up on society. Right. You know, catch up on what's really going on. Right. You know, and it's, it's, it's cool. Right. So if you are wondering about the trip too, man, we're going to Connecticut. I'm going to Connecticut to be on Locked In with Ian Bick. I got Eric on the show as well. I'm hoping he might let us do something together where we can do one with me, one with you, and then me and you together. Um, We'll see how Ian works out with that. And then we're going to be on camp. Probably can't get Eric on camp because he's got a tight schedule. But that's Mark Gagnon's show. And then I'm going to hook up with Chad Marks in Brooklyn, man. And I I can't wait for that one. I think he's going to be a trip. This is going to be an awesome trip. So, yeah. And we're going to vlog and record 90% of what we do. Yes, we are. Uh, Stay tuned. We're getting ready to hook this thing up right now. And get us some uh, extra electric and some extra things going on in here and uh, get this thing ready for the road. Mm-hmm, for sure. Man, this thing looks nice, too. Just on the last couple of weeks, you know, I've seen a lot of difference. Looks really good, buddy. Yeah, it's come together, man. So if we can keep everything from falling off the walls on our way eight yeah. hours eight yeah. hours north, we'll mm-hmm. be good. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm excited for the road trip. It's going to be awesome. Good yeah, times. it's definitely going to be crazy. So, yeah, drop a like, man. Drop a comment. Ask any questions you got for Eric. If you think he should hang out with the channel, if you like him on the channel, let me know that, man. Tell me what y'all think. And uh, see Like, you. subscribe, share. Right. Do all those things. See ya. Cool.